Um, so welcome uh, to UTSC OBPRI Research Excellence Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Joshua Van Rye, I'm a Research Services Officer uh, in the OVPRI at UTSC. And I'm here with my colleague uh, from the OVPRI, Jason Darby. We want to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate and can perceive uh, all that is presented today. Should you need to turn on uh, live captions, please go to your meeting controls. Under more actions, you can turn on or off live captioning. I'm going to turn off my video now just to ensure a good connection for everyone. And just uh, some housekeeping. So a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Um, to please mute your audio and turn off your video uh, to accommodate those that do not have enough bandwidth. And uh, just know that we'll be hosting a recording of this event on the UTSC Research YouTube channel, as well as the OVPRI website at a future date. Um, this information will be put into the chat box at the end of the question and answer period, as well as um, I'll be able to send out the links to these sites and channels uh, directly to all participants after the event. And uh, we ask that participants hold questions till the end of the talk. And if you do have any questions, please put them into the chat box. And so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Professor Irina Cree. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second offering of the 2021 Celebration of Research Excellence Lecture Series. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Celebration of Research Excellence Lecture Series is sponsored by the OVPRI and celebrates those who have won awards from our office, the Principal's Research Award, as well as recipients of Canada Research Chairs and the Royal Society. Today, we are celebrating Professor Nick Mandrak. Nick is this year's recipient of the Principal's Research Award. Nick is a professor in biological sciences, as well as the director of the conservation and biodiversity stream of the professional Masters of Environmental Science program at UT Scarborough. His research interests in biodiversity and conservation focus on Canadian freshwater fishes with an emphasis on endangered and invasive species. Nick is a leader within his scientific community. For example, he is co-chair of the Freshwater Fishes Species Specialist Subcommittee of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. He is also president of the Canadian Aquatic Resources Section of the American Fisheries Society. He has co-authored over 100 primary publications, over 100 government reports, 40 Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada reports, and three books, including the Royal Ontario Museum Field Guide to Ontario Fishes. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Irina. Uh, and uh, just Joshua, it doesn't look like you can share my screen yet. Okay, let me see if. Uh... You should have control at this point. Do you not? Uh... It says only meeting organizers and presenters can share. Can share. So mm -hmm. I don't that um, the box with the arrow is not highlighted. One second. Sorry, so let me see if I can figure this out here. Well, we're sorting that out. I'd just like to, to thank everyone for joining. Uh, I know there's online fatigue and there are no free tea and cookies, so uh, you joined regardless, so thank you very much. I thought there was a free lunch after your talk, Nick. <laughs> Well, uh, unfortunately, I will not be attending if there is. Uh, and again, while we're sorting this out, um, I, I could start by uh, saying, you know, I wanted to start this talk with uh, uh, one of two stories, and I couldn't decide which one uh, to start it with. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you both of them. Uh, the first one was uh, when I first joined uh, the university in 2013. Uh, the departmental sage Rudy Boonstra told me, you know, Nick, you should really 
decide what you want to be known for and work on that one topic. I think he failed to realize that um, I had been, you know, I was mid-career and I'd just been coming off of 13 years as a government scientist and that pretty much my research trajectory was, um, um, was set and that basically I was only about 10 years younger than Rudy. And I, I think the advice is, is fabulous for uh, new starting assistant professors, but for, uh, for an old dog like me, uh, you can't teach me new tricks. And uh, so I told him, I, I just hope that uh, I'm recognized as knowing something about fishes. And uh, it, this, this talk's gonna be an example of that. It, it really isn't on one topic. It's, it's about my, my research program and, uh, I, and this sort of underlying theme of, of um, conserving uh, biodiversity, uh, in, particularly in the Great Lakes region, uh, by, by looking into the past understanding what we can do now and, and seeing what the, the future holds. And uh, the other story is, is actually related to um, a paper I did a few years ago. I was invited to do a, um, a, a book chapter and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause there and I can now uh, share my screen and I'll, I'll finish that story in just a second. Okay. Please confirm you can see my screen. We can see it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and I, I want to um, just uh, acknowledge uh, Principal Teddy for the award, uh, my colleagues in the department, and across the university uh, that have, have made my research program possible, including uh, our, our, the staff at the university that um, keep my finances organized and, 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 and keep my research moving forward in that way. Uh, my many collaborators and my funders. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to um, my good friend, uh, Olaf Weil, who um, tragically passed away last uh, last year while in the field in South Africa. He was a figurative and literal giant in, in uh, fr freshwater fisheries in, in South Africa. Uh, of course, none of my research could be possible without my amazing lab uh, with my graduate students and postdocs. Thank you very much uh, for being part of the lab and uh, uh, ha having, um, making sure that all of us grow together. And of course, uh, I think with all of us, um, um, we, we would not be successful in our research careers without our, our unconditional support and love from our families. So this is, this is my, uh, this is my second story. So I was asked to give a talk on the, the um, emerging issues for, fit for uh, early career researchers in the area of invasive species. And I, I was asked specifically to invite a junior, uh, an early career researcher to be a junior author on, on the project. And uh, unfortunately, I can't see the chat. Other, and if we were in person, I would have just asked you to yell out some names. But I want you to think about if you grew up on the shores of Lake, uh, the Great Lakes, what were your earliest memories of invasive species? What were they? Or if you didn't, what, what were the invasive species you first encountered uh, when you first arrived in the basin? Well, basically, the, the early career re researcher that I invited to, to um, co-author this, this chapter was Andrew Drake. As it turns out, Andrew and I grew up about 10 kilometers from one another in Mississauga, but a generation apart. And when we started talking about um, our experiences, uh, our first experiences with the, you know, Lake Ontario and in, in, in the Mississauga, Andrew said, oh, I, you know, I remember walking down to the beach and cutting my feet on, on zebra mussel shells. And I was thinking to myself, zebra mussel shells, I never saw one. Well, that's because, uh, you know, I was, you know, I'm 20 years older than, than Andrew. And what I remember is uh, dead alewife uh, stinking up the shoreline every spring as as they would die off due to thermal stress and 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 they would rot. 
And what this actually really made me think about is Andrew and I have very different perspectives on what what the, uh, the baseline condition of the Great Lakes is. And it, it started making me think a lot about how there's different perceptions of um, the Great Lakes depending on uh, when you first experience them. And this is sort of the lead into my 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 thoughts about this, you know, brief history of the the fish communities uh, of the Great Lakes uh, past, present, and future. And Andrew and I ended up uh, writing writing a uh, a chapter that uh, talks about how how will invasive species impact the future of fisheries, a Great Lakes perspective. I thought one of the most interesting things about the chapter is we actually were able to animate some of one of the key messages. And, and you know, historically, we, we have really failed to consider the stakeholders when we, when we think about conducting research on an ecosystem or, or managing an ecosystem. And that was one of the big take homes, um, the human dimensions of, of managing ecosystems. And, and uh, the, the different stakeholder views are, were summarized uh, in in uh, this this series of uh, comics. Now, my my research program is the biogeography, biodiversity, and conservation of freshwater fishes, with an emphasis on Canada and, and the Great Lakes. And you know, during the course of this research uh, career, I have looked at the past, the present, and the future of the Great Lakes. And uh, I'm going to sort of piece together elements of this research. And, and in fact, as I was doing this, I realized that I sort of was reflecting on my own past, present, and future, uh, as you'll see in upcoming slides. And, you know, uh, I do work on both invasive and in endangered species, but I just couldn't fit that all in to uh, this talk today. Uh, and I also do research on on controlling invasive species, but we're going to exclude uh, the endangered species and controlling invasive species uh, parts from from today's talk. So let's start with the past. Well, I think most of you know that 12,000 years ago, where we are now, uh, was under a well, 18,000 years ago was under um, a sheet of ice at least a kilometer thick, and and there were no Great Lakes. And then, as the uh, ice sheet started to recede, recede northward, these uh, northwards, these these depressed base, these basins that were depressed under the weight of, weight of the ice started collecting the meltwaters, and the Great Lakes started forming. And and um, so, when when an ice sheet covered all of the Great Lakes and all of Canada, there were essentially no fishes in Canada at the time. Uh, and uh, as those uh, the ice sheet receded, receded and, and this is a map of uh, these massive uh, glacial lakes that, that ponded the meltwaters following the last ice age, and the red represents the maximum extent of the last ice age. Um, these, these lakes and the, and the uh, drainages that connected them actually acted as dispersal corridors for, for species to invade um, Canada from southern refugia following the last ice age. And here's an example. Well, here's a, um, a schematic that uh, Chris Wilson and I put together for a recent book on, on the history of uh, lake trout uh, to, to, to show where these fishes came from and how they spread throughout Ontario through these glacial water bodies following the last ice age. And then at some point, Isostatic rebound, that is the, 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 the elevation of the lands following the re release of the weight of the ice, formed the modern day drainages and this ongoing colonization of Canada ceased. And uh, going back into my own past, this is something that I actually looked at for my, my masters under the supervision of um, E.J. Crossman at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, back in the early 90s, uh, the beginning of my career. And, and uh, the arrows down in this part of the map are, der are derived from my research that was published in the early 90s. But reflecting on this made me, made me um, realize that there is a, 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 an unknown researcher, Isabel Radforth, 
who was the pioneer in looking at the relationship between species distributions and glacial geology. And she published this seminal uh, uh, monograph in 1944 called Some Considerations on the Distribution of Fishes in Ontario, which was entirely related to the relationship between their distribution and, and glacial history. And uh, unfortunately, this is the only thing that she ever published, but I just wanted to recognize uh, uh, I I Isabel and the, the important contribution she made not only to uh, Canadian ichthyology, but also to global uh, ichthyology and, and biogeography, because people had just not thought about this connection uh, in detail before Isabel. Now, if we look at the, the, uh, the fish species richness in, in the Great Lakes by basin, uh, you can see I provided the, the number of native species that were here up until about 200 years ago uh, before uh, uh, Europeans started introducing non-native species into the Great Lakes Basin, directly or indirectly. So we have about 150 native species and about 30, uh, 30 to 40 non-native species species are um, currently present in the basin. And uh, uh, a little while ago, uh, we actually um, reconstructed uh, when, when non-native species were introduced in each one of the basins over time from, from basically 1870 to the year 2000. And you can see that uh, Michigan has the most um, non-native species, uh, about 25, and, and followed by uh, Lake Huron. And then uh, conversely, you can see that we're actually starting to lose native species over time as well, uh, in part as the result of uh, the introduction of non-native species, but also other impacts such as habitat degradation and destruction and uh, overfishing. And uh, here are some of the uh, some of the invasive species that that have uh, colonized the Great Lakes over time. Uh, from the very earliest, uh, the carp were were introduced in the 1860s, um, uh, deliberately for for food fish. Uh, follow and then uh, sea lamprey came through canals. We deliberately introduced salmon's multiple times. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And here are some of the more recent invaders, round goby, uh, and then the, one, the, the uh, species are on the cusp of becoming established in the Great Lakes, uh, grass carp, which is now established in Lake Erie, and tench that has just colonized uh, Lake Ontario, but uh, not yet established to our knowledge. And if we take that, that graph from a couple of slides ago, we can actually look at these, these, these patterns of change. So here are the natives, the, the, here's the decline in native species, and here is the increase in uh, non-native species over time. If you actually take these data, we can actually reconstruct for each basin the, act, the, the species list by decade. Uh, so we know what species were in what, um, uh, what in each basin by decade and, and how that species list changed over time. And, and this question about how fish communities change over time is a key question in ecology. And it's one that uh, Sarah Campbell uh, looked at in some depth. And uh, what we see here is in, um, in, the, in the past, uh, most researchers have looked at uh, how, uh, how uh, communities have changed over two time periods. We actually looked at this over uh, between decades, between 1870 and 2010. So we're among the first researchers to look at this, this idea of homogenization, that is uh, uh, communities getting more similar to one another over multiple time periods, um, with the idea that if you just looked at two time periods, you may get a, um, a superficial understanding of homogenization depending on what time period you chose. And what we see is from a taxonomic perspective, from a you know, a species level perspective, we see that the Great Lakes overall between basins have homogenized on average by about 6%. So they've become 6% more similar uh, to 
to one another across the basins. Well, uh, species level homogenization is one way to look at it, but we could also, it, it doesn't give you the whole picture of how a community and an ecosystem functions. What uh, helps give you a better picture is um, what traits those species actually possess. Uh, because those traits are more closely linked to the to the uh, the niches that they they fill within the ecosystem, and uh, Sarah did end up looking at uh, homogenization not only taxonomically but um, functional what we call uh, functional uh, homogenization, and she concluded so this is the basically this this black line is basically the same taxonomic line as in the figure on the left. This, um, this lighter line is known as a convex hull volume. All you need to know is that this is a measure of um, functional traits. And, and what we see is that, that it varies over time as the community changes, um, the, the functional traits become more similar and less similar across the basins. And the overall trend is in fact um, positive in the sense that over time, the functional traits have become less similar. And the, the idea is that in the beginning there of, in the, the original native community, there may have been high uh, uh, functional um, diversity, uh, um, sorry, there, there may have been um, uh, a, um, a high functional redundancy, so a lot of traits that overlapped and as new species came in, they had different traits that increased the, the functional diversity. And as a result, we have not seen that homogenization. Now, the uh, what I've talked about today to, to so far is, is uh, about those, those introduced species that became established, but we also know that many species have been introduced and have, have, have failed, have not become established. And we can actually use that knowledge to make predictions about what species are likely to become established in the future. And you know, an here's a good example of a species that has not become established, piranha. Uh, and the question is, why have they not become established? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, there may not be sufficient numbers of individuals introduced into a single water body that can find one another in, in order to re reproduce. This is called low propagule pressure. Um, or they may actually not be able to survive over winter uh, because uh, the the match between the climate in the Great Lakes to the climate in their native distribution is too low. And for prawn, it's probably a combination of both of these. But again, um, we can look at this this uh, the the failed introdu uh, introductions and 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 gain some insight into what makes a successful invader to the Great Lakes. And I did this like, for an under, my undergraduate thesis uh, under uh, Dr. Henry Regeer uh, back in the uh, mid 1980s in, in a, using an approach which is now you know, generally known as trait-based modeling. So I'm basically looking at what are the traits of the, the recent successful invaders? And the trait, you know, so I summarized traits for all the recent successful invaders and then traits for potential invaders that currently occur in the Mississippi that could move northward under climate change. And, and uh, the traits include, uh, you know, adult and spawning habitat, reproduction, uh, species interactions, are they predator or prey? Um, and, and what we see here is these open circles represent uh, sort of the, the um, the envelope of traits in multivariate space of the successful invaders. So the idea is that you need to, if you're a potential invader, you need to be within the space in order to be deemed potentially successful. Um, and if you're outside of that space, you're unlikely to be a successful invader. Uh, as we now know, there are some issues with this whole concept and it's related to Darwin's conundrum of, um, where he suggested that invaders need to uh, be similar to native species in the region in which they invade, similar enough that they could survive in that same environment, but not so similar 
that they actually would be competing or outcompeted by those those native species. And what we see here is that uh, my model worked at about a 72% correct classification rate, which is is pretty modest by by modern standards. But again, this is one of the the first trait-based models to be applied to uh, freshwater fishes. Uh, more recently, uh, I was part of a, a University of Notre Dame project where we did updated trait-based modeling, and and we we took a much more rigorous approach, and we took we took better advantage of those failed invaders. And uh, so what we did initially is we we basically looked at the the um, 37 success, successful invaders and the 28 failed invaders, and we summarized 18 traits that we thought were um, may have influenced uh, success, successful invasion. And uh, we used a CART uh, analysis to determine which one of those traits could, uh, would allow us to predict establishment. As it turns out, only one trait, whether or not there's a climate match between the Great Lakes and the native range of the species. If it's greater than 71%, then uh, then this the this species will uh, become established, and you can see that it's a, there's a relatively high uh, prediction rate and and um, uh, we confirm these with uh, cross validation. I'm not presenting that today. And then we we separately looked at uh, can we predict impact and 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 we we uh, actually did an expert opinion survey to determine what the impact of these successful introductions were, and and we included the twelve the species with the twelve highest impacts and the twelve lowest impact scores in this analysis, and you could see that piscivores or invertebrates slash piscivores are likely to have a high impact. If if you're not a piscivore, then but you have uh, very high fecundity, you lay a lot of eggs, you're gonna have a high impact. Um, Non-piscivores that are, do not have high fecundity are likely not to kind of have a high impact. Okay, so one of, the, one of the concerns about this type of modeling that this uh, model does not address is that, that question that I raised on the piranha slide, that is, um, we include failed introductions that may have failed because there was insufficient propagule pressure. That is, not enough individuals were actually introduced into the Great Lakes uh, to find one another to establish a reproducing population. So, so um, we we failed to consider that. But uh, uh, Sarah uh, was very interested in this question, and basically uh, did a regression-based model. Uh, where she looked at um, at uh, she included only species that had failed for which there had been sufficient propagule pressure. And the perfect example of this are the salmon species, the Chinook salmon, the coho salmon, uh, even rainbow trout. When they were first introduced into the Great Lakes around the 1900s, they failed to establish. Uh, they were introduced again uh, in the mid-century. Uh, and um, there was limited successful establishment, and it wasn't until the late 1960s that when they were introduced for a third time that they became successfully established. Now, the propagule pressure was high throughout all of those time periods because, um, because uh, they wanted to establish the species in the Great Lakes, yet they did not establish. So what changed over time? What changed over time? was as you if you remember back to my original slides is the community um so there were some uh, uh non-native species became established and some native species were lost so the actual community changed over time and so what uh sarah did was she actually developed trait-based models to predict whether or not um uh the salmon introductions would have been successful in the 1920s community. So she wasn't comparing it to the, the current community like we did in, in the, the Howith et al. model, but she was comparing the, the, um, the uh, traits of the salmons to the 1900 community, the 1950 community, and the 2000 community. 
And uh, she, she all, in doing so, she identified what the important traits were here on the left-hand side of the uh, slide. And I, you may not be seeing my pointer, so I'm going to change it. There we go. Here, she identified what the important traits might be. And then you can see in this, the, on the right-hand side that, that this is the probability of establishment. And, and this is how, how, how close any given species is in multivariate space to its nearest neighbor. Just consider this to be just a measure of uh, functional trait. And it showed that, basically this shows that the probability of establishment was pretty low um, as you, uh, um, uh, as you, um, as you become, became, the salmon became less similar to those species with uh, similar traits. And then in 1950, you can see that actually it changed because the community had changed. And by 2000, you could see that um, it, uh, the salmon was likely, it was successful because it was similar to some species that were uh, now present in the uh, ecosystem. So this is an excellent example of how um, context dependence is important when, when trying to predict uh, the success of uh, in, in, uh, introduced species into a new environment. Hmm. I... There we go. Okay, I want to shift to the present. And um, here's one of the students uh, collecting eDNA samples this summer on the Sogging Peninsula. And this is really related to uh, a real interest of our labs, which is developing novel methods for sampling freshwater fishes. So, um, you know, if, if you think about in, invasive species or endangered species, at certain points, they're going to be very difficult to find using conventional gears because they'll be in low numbers. In terms of endangered species, um, their populations may, may be decimated to, the, decimated to the point where you, they're very difficult to find uh, um, and they're on, on the, the road to extinction and, and you want to identify where they are found in order to enact concert, you know, uh, con conservation actions. In terms of invasive species, when they're first introduced, they're found in very low numbers before their population sizes increase. Um, so we need to find alternate methods that are, are more sensitive to species that occur in very low numbers that may be difficult to detect using conventional sampling. And I worked, uh, Karen, uh, sorry, Catherine, who ended up working, completing her PhD in, in Nate Lovejoy's lab, did her master's um, with uh, Dan Heath and me at the University of Windsor, and where she developed um, environmental DNA methods to detect rare and invasive fish species uh, in the Great Lakes and um, uh, using a metabarcoding approach. So I think the, um, uh, so, and she, can, she actually compared her results to the whole history of conventional sampling. So she developed a species list for the two rivers based on the whole history of conventional sampling and compared her eDNA sampling results, which was one-time sampling at each one of these sites to the whole history of sampling at, at those sites using conventional gears and found that the, that, that there was a 70%, 76% match in the Grand River of species lists and, and a 51% match uh, in the Sydenham River, which suggests that eDNA methods might be quite promising. And, and they did, they did uh, the methods did detect several endangered species and, and uh, the invasive uh, Rangobi as well. So, um, this is a very promising novel method for sampling uh, freshwater uh, fishes, particularly endangered invasive species. Well, there may be other methods. Some, it, and and we were interested in looking at other methods as well because there may be certain certain cer certain circumstances where eDNA may not work as well or may be unaffordable. And um, here's a project that uh, PhD student uh, Rochira Castaneda led and was co-supervised by 
uh, Olaf Weil in South Africa and me, and we did half of the research in South Africa and half in, in Canada. And it was, it was useful to do the research in South Africa because they, they have these very clear systems with very few species, which are unlike our systems in Southern Ontario that are a lot less clear and have a lot more species. So in, in this project, uh, Rashira compared eDNA results. Uh, in this case, uh, we were looking for in, invasive and endangered species. In this case, I'm only presenting the results for the two endangered species. But she compared eDNA results to um, snorkeling surveys where she sur this, uh, swam transects in these areas and um, enumerated fishes and then also um, compared to cam uh, GoPro cameras being set in a location over time. Uh, and what you see is, well, there's no real significant difference amongst them uh, in terms of the probability of de detecting one or the other of these species. Uh, but you can see in general, the, uh, the camera and snorkel uh, results or uh, detection results are a little higher than eDNA. Detection probability simply means what's the probability of detecting the species if it was found with at least one of these three gear types. And so uh, why would we even consider doing some of these different methods? Well, one, the cost of eDNA, which is cheaper than conventional, but more expensive and requires specialized equipment. And in countries like South Africa, that the, such uh, facilities may not be relevant relatively or may readily available. And, and, and two, because you may get quicker results with either snorkeling or, or, ca or cameras. And one of the reasons they're particularly interested in th these methods is the, um, the area in which they're working is quite remote uh, and, and it would virtually impossible to get a conventional gear in there. Uh, often, Rashir would have to hike uh, for a day to get to these um, sites, including uh, hiking through the water. Uh, the colleague that she worked with uh, at one site had to jump off a cliff and then had to camp for two weeks as he's made his way down to an access point downstream. So there's a lot of challenges to these uh, remote area sampling in these remote areas. The other thing I want to bring up is there are potential confounding factors that influence detection probability. And Rashira looked at this. So in, in the top, uh, we, we're looking at the length of the pool. So th this, the length of the pool uh, influence uh, detection probability. Well, it, you can see it does in, in, in shorter pool lengths. You're, you know, you're less likely to detect um, uh, th the, uh, this species with either the, um, uh, the solid line is the underwater cameras or the um, snorkel, snorkeling, uh, you can see turbidity has a, a real impact on detecting the species from an eDNA perspective. And, and we believe that uh, increased turbidity is an inhibitor to, um, to eDNA. And then uh, you can see the same uh, for all three methods, eDNA, snorkeling and camera, uh, detection probability goes down with increasing turbidity for this endangered Cape Kerper. And you can imagine that with snorkeling and camera, that that visual these visual methods uh, are negatively impacted by turbidity, which we see, we see here. And uh, you know, uh, we we're also developing methods uh, to to ad to identify eggs and larvae. Um, eggs and larvae, fish eggs and larvae are basically virtually impossible to identify to species. Uh, there's a very few people in the world that can actually do this uh, very well. So we, we thought, well, let's skip the step and let's just um, homogenize our larval samples and, and, and do meta barcoding on them. And uh, with the idea that, that you, you know, if we can't detect the adults, we may be able to detect the eggs and the larvae of endangered and invasive species. And, and further, if we detect the eggs and larvae of an invasive species that's telling us that the species is actually reproducing is likely established, right? So Kavi Galage did his, his master's on this and, and Alex Van and, and 
Nanatin is um, is following up on this research, and here's some results. So we went back to the the the, uh, the Grand River again, worked on the Thames, uh, the Asable River, and the Credit River, and again this results in the simplest um, sense. Uh, incident frequency, the number of um, of uh, larval samples, and th these are samples that are collected with larval conventional methods such as light traps um, and, 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 and fine uh, nets. Uh, we can see that we did detect in, in the invasive um, goby in the Credit River, invasive carp in the Credit in the Grand River, and invasive um, rud in the Credit River, and I think this is the first record of the, the rud in the Credit River. Uh, so a, another, uh, you know, um, uh, evaluation of um, of a novel method that can help out in uh, invasive and endangered species management. Okay, it, and I just now want to just wrap up by talk, briefly talking about the future. Um, PhD student Megan Kindry spent several years in the field in the lab conducting. Uh, um, critical thermal maximum temperatures uh, to look at what the the potential effect of uh, increasing temperatures, i.e. As, re, um, as related to climate change, may influence the interactions between uh, native and invasive species. And she did this in, in, in a very nice set of, um, uh, of experiments. Uh, to give you, the, and she worked on the white sucker, which is a, a a native species that is a, acts much in the same way as as salmon do. Um, they 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 live in lakes and then they have these spawning runs in the spring, uh, in which they they a lot of the energy from the lake and deposit it in the stream in the form of their their eggs and in the form of their carcasses when when they die. They don't die. Uh, they don't always die immediately after spawning, but it's after some spot, at some point, they'll die from old age after their last spawn, and they contribute these nutrients uh, and energy to the watershed. So they they have an important ecological role here. And uh, here's some data from the the Toronto area, and and it's interesting that the white sucker is a lives on the bottom. It's a benthic species, and we can see that its abundance. Uh, CP, CPUE is catch per unit effort. Just think of it as abundance. Went down dramatically after round goby uh, arrived, and of course this does not suggest cause and effect, but it allows us to develop a hypothesis that um, round goby, the invasive round goby, has negatively impacted uh, the native white sucker. And so uh, the obvious thing to do is to, to study the diet in the field. And what Megan found is there's a significant overlap in, in the diet between uh, round goby and white sucker uh, in these different watersheds uh, in the in the Greater Toronto area. The next I, the next thought was okay, well, uh, what's what would happen under climate change? Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, um, Alexa is answering this question for me. I don't know why, <laughs> but so the uh, what would happen under climate change? Uh, will will thermal preferences favor uh, competition of one species over the other? And what we see here, based on on de uh, determining uh, th uh, CT maxes in the field, is that. Yes, uh, the round goby has warmer uh, thermal uh, tolerance than than white sucker. So this is not looking good for white sucker. And then if we add to that, uh, what's the what's the relationship between uh, feeding rate and, and temperature? And and Megan did this in the lab. You see that the feeding rates are higher at all temperatures. Uh, you know, sort of representing existing conditions and then future conditions, brown goby is feeding at a higher rate than in white sucker. So we're starting to build the case that there's already a competition between the two species. Under climate change, uh, it looks like that, that um, round goby is going to be 
continue to outcompete white sucker. And then the one last experiment that she added to this was she added velocity. So white suckers are actually better adapted to higher flows than than uh, round goby. And she did the, her ex feeding experiments in a in 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 a swim chamber where she could modify the velocities and and see, look at feeding rates. Um, at, at different velocities, and the one thing we see is these are the rates that we we saw, you know, under under no velocities like your previous experiments. But when you start increasing the the stream flow or the water flow velocity, white sucker starts feeding at um, a higher rate, and uh, this actually may mean that uh, higher velocities may provide a refuge for white sucker from from round goby um, uh, under changing climate. However, uh, you know, reduced uh, stream flows may be a also a consequence of climate change, and that might take that refugium away from the white sucker. Okay, last, uh, last study I want to mention, uh, Justin Hubbard, completed his uh, master's looking at the effects of climate change on a global scale. So uh, this is basically looking at how well the Great Lakes ecosystem uh, is matched to the rest of the ecosystems in the world. And so basically, if, if, if the Great Lakes has a match to 71% you know, or higher to the other eco regions, species in those eco regions, based on the Howith model, would likely become established in the Great Lakes or could become established in the Great Lakes if they were to reach there by whatever means. Well, what would happen under a climate change scenario? Um, Justin looked at that and what he identified is uh, some additional uh, eco regions in various parts of the world and in uh, South uh, Eastern Europe, the, the Adriatic area that now become suitable uh, donor areas for invasive species uh, to the Great Lakes. So climate change will actually increase the areas of the world that have a match to the Great Lakes, which will increase uh, the potential number of species that could become a, a established in the Great Lakes if they were introduced there. As a follow-up, uh, Justin, uh, looked at both freshwater, and this is the first chapter from his PhD thesis, looked at the first, uh, at the, um, at uh, how, how, how climate change will influence uh, both freshwater ecoregions and terrestrial ecoregions. And basically, he looked at the change in the mean climate match from the present to the 2090 uh, scenario and found that, for example, here, um, you see that the uh, the, uh, the near Arctic uh, is going to become increasingly more similar to the rest of the world than some other areas. Uh, same with um, uh, northern South America and, and parts of uh, temperate uh, Asia. These are the areas that are going to become more similar to other parts of the world as the result will become more susceptible to invasion, successful invasion. And if we look at, we see similar patterns on uh, with the terrestrial ecoregions as well. And uh, uh, th he summarized the, this uh, in in uh, these very interesting plots. Basically, uh, what's this? What this is showing is wherever you have thick lines, this is where uh, you know. Um, between, for example, between the near Arctic and Paleo Arctic, the uh, climate matches have, have increased to the point that it will influence um, uh, potential invasions. So anywhere where you have uh, uh, arrows, the thicker the arrow, uh, the the greater the increasing risk of invasion between the 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 two regions. Okay, this uh, I'm. I'm so I'm uh, coming to the end, uh, going back to the earliest days of my research career, predicting the next invaders. Uh, you remember uh, I, I talked about this. The, the one thing I didn't talk about at the time was 
predicting what Mississippi species could end up in the Great Lakes under climate change, uh, knowing that there is a connection between the Mississippi and the Great Lakes, uh, known as the shipping, uh, the Chicago Shipping and Sanitary Canal, which now has an electrical barrier in it to prevent such movement, but didn't when I did this research. Um, uh, I've been around long enough that I can actually test my predictions. <laughs> and um, so the yeses are where my prediction has actually come true. Not very many whys there, not very many yeses. Uh, and then there are more noes where, where these non-potential invaders have actually uh, invaded the Great Lakes. Uh, and I think this says a lot about how rudimentary my, this initial model was. Uh, and uh, just, I, I do feel vindicated though, because uh, we published this paper uh, in 2018 as a rapid communication, identifying the Eurasian tench as the next invader. And within six months, it was found in the Great Lakes. So I, I feel partially vindicated. Um, and uh, at this point, I would just uh, say thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much for a fabulous talk, Nick. Not only your personal journey, but being able to uh, test your predictions from when you were young <laughs> at this age is a pretty remarkable feat. Um, I think we only have five minutes for questions and I'll keep my eye on the chat, but I will start by asking one, although you may have answered it, but maybe you could just um, make, respond to it in any case. You talk about climate match being a key factor for an invasion. And you talk about the probability of establishment of invaders' success is increasing. And I think that le leads or contributes to a homogenization of the structure and functional traits of the communities. Do you, if I got that right, is, do you think or do you now predict a threshold in the homogenization beyond which we could get a fishery collapse? Oh, uh, that, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think it's going to lead to a collapse. I, what I think it's going to lead to is um, a, a loss of, you know, a loss of of uh, um, uh, uh, biodiversity uh, at at, um, at at the beta level, you know, uh, and. You know the fact that we're seeing this homogenization, and I, I think the flip side is note that this, that the, the lakes are still 60, only 60 percent similar, and um, the the uh, the question of homogenization is important uh, from the perspective of how should we manage the Great Lakes going to the future? Should we just give up and say if it's in one lake, it's going to get to to the others? I think not. I think we should maintain. The, the the communities as, as distinctly as possible to maintain that diversity um, uh, going into the future. Uh, I really can't answer that that the homogen you know at what point does the homogenization just mean that the whole thing collapses? Uh, I, I it's a great question. Uh, I just I, I can't predict that. Uh, well, you can uh, predict it, and we'll wait for another thirty years to see if yeah. you can test that. Well, hopefully I'm around. <laughs> I, hopefully I'm around. Yes. <laughs> to do so. um, my our friend uh, Carl has a question, and he says, uh, "You first of all, great talk, Nick. You noted the difference in functional traits that enabled the establishment of non-native salmonids in the Great Lakes. Do you recall the species that enabled this?" It, it's it's not the species per se. It's the overall. Um, uh, multivariate space that the spe the the species um, um, live in from a a, a, a um, functional trait perspective, but the species that would have come in at that time would have been species like um, um, white bass uh, in some lakes, probably sea lamprey. Uh, but we're, don't forget, we're also losing species as well. Uh, some 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 potential predators. Uh, definitely lost Atlantic salmon. Um, that uh, lost, uh, we're losing lake trout from some of the lakes. So, so particularly some of those deep water species may have 
um, may have, uh, the loss of some of those deep water native species, some of the Cisco's may have allowed uh, resources, deep water offshore resources to become available for the salmonid. So it's not any one species, but you're right. What you could you can actually do is you could reconstruct the story by actually looking at those species lists before and after introduction to, in order to identify what the actual changes were. I've given you some ideas in general, but we, we look at it more holistically about you know, from from that uh, multivariate perspective and in the ordination. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, I think our, our time is now at a close and I'm going to pass it back uh, to Joshua to wrap up the day. OK, thank you, Professor Creed, and, and thank you, Professor Man, Professor Mandrak. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, just a few websites for you to check out. Here's Professor Mandrak's uh, website at UTSC, as well as our YouTube channel and the OVPRI website. Uh, just a reminder that the next OVPRI Research Excellence Lecture Series will be Wednesday, February 2nd. Um, and this, uh, this talk, we'll be hosting it um, at some point later today, actually, on the YouTube channel. So everyone who's uh, signed up for this event will be sent a link to that video, as well as a, a paper by Professor Mandrak. So thanks again, everyone, for showing up, and uh, have a good day. Thank thanks you, everyone. Again, Nick. You're welcome. Bye-bye.